This episode is sponsored by my Fall Fast Track, the only six-week distance mastermind course to help you profit from the private market using performance testing. Enrollment starts on August 1st. Find out more at homeperformance.training. Welcome to the Building Performance Podcast from the Building Performance Workshop. I'm Corbett Lunsford, and we are talking today again with the amazing Lou Harriman, who is the founder of Mason Grant Consulting uh, in New Hampshire and also the author of multiple ashray books on humidity control. Lou, thanks so much for talking with us. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, always. <laughs> so, uh, listeners, Lou and I were having a conversation. We're in his home, and I started asking him about humidity control, and then I said, wait, stop. We need to record this. So we were in the middle of kind of getting into the conversation about humidity. And uh, I wanted you guys to be able to hear what Lou has to say because he is one of the world experts on moisture in buildings. So when I asked you, how about drying? Like, what exactly is it? How do we start to think about it? You said that there's a basic principle that we start with, which is? Well, when you're, when you're thinking about drying, the first thing you want to uh, be conscious of is whether you're talking about drying air or whether you're drying stuff. Because a lot of the confusion about dehumidification comes from the desire to dry stuff, which is different. And a lot of the confusion about drying stuff has to do with dehumidification in the psychrometric chart, which is very confusing on both sides of that divide. So it's useful, very useful to think, first of all, when you're thinking about drying, start with, am I talking about taking water out of air? Or am I taking water out of stuff? Okay. Begin with that. And then, so my follow-up question to that would be, if in inside we dry out the stuff, wouldn't that, as a side effect, dry out the air? Absolutely, it would. Because there's no, there's no getting around the fact that water in stuff, moisture in stuff comes into the air, and moisture in the air goes into stuff. And that happens dynamically all the time. All the time. Uh, no, no matter what's happening. Even when it's very dry inside, there's some statistical probability that some of that moisture in the air, the humidity in the air, will get into stuff. Hmm. But there's a much bigger probability when the air is quite relatively dry inside that the water is going to be coming out of the stuff and going into the air. Mm -hmm. But it's going in both directions at the same time. In the same way as you are giving off heat to the sun, at the same time as sun is giving off heat to you. It's just that the sun is giving you a whole lot more heat than you're giving to the sun. Ugh, everything is so complicated. <laughs> Life is difficult. Okay, so in one of the previous podcasts that you were on, we talked uh, briefly about um, the fact that up till the 1990s, everyone assumed that the hotter it was outside, the more moisture there was in the air. And then you realized when... Uh, you were part of a research team that actually measured things, that that was all wrong. How, what else have you found out that kind of is assumed by engineers in general, um, down through the eras even, that actually once we apply research to it is not true? Well, I think uh, one of the biggest gee whiz forehead slappers uh, in my career, in my working career, has been uh, the uh, understanding what happens in a home uh, when, you, uh, when you change its temperature. The interesting thing to me uh, and the unexpected thing, well, let me put it another way. Let's start with the fact that uh, in the engineering community, we, we, we think about uh, absolute humidity versus relative humidity. Absolute humidity being the amount of water in the air and the relative humidity being the amount of water in the air compared to what that air could hold at that same temperature. And, and in the humidity control business, uh, the people, geeky folks like myself, have always said that uh, while you might have differences in relative humidity throughout a building because the temperature changes throughout a building, uh, the dew point, the absolute humidity, stays pretty much constant, uh, independent of the dry bulb temperature. And that's wrong. Hmm. That's completely wrong. So... Um, what, how I found that out is measuring things <laughs> and monitoring things. Um, and what happens is that, much to my surprise as a guy who's spent a lot of time in desiccant dehumidification, is that it doesn't take a big change in the amount of total energy in the system. In other words, the, it doesn't take a big dry bulb temperature change in a house to make a difference in the dew point in that air because 
moisture does come out of the material and it goes into the material based on very relatively small changes in dry bulb temperature. For example, I'll give you, give you a couple numbers on this. If we have a, a dew point of, uh, let's say, 45 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a fairly dry condition in the summertime in a, in a house, that's an air-conditioned you know, house, um, and if you don't have air conditioning, if you don't have heating, you're just watching the temperature get warmer in the house because it's heating up, you know, because we're not doing any cooling. Uh, and if we were to go from a temperature of 70 to, let's say, 80 you know, in a house, the dew point might go from 45 to 65. The absolute amount of moisture is going to go up by a lot, by 20 degrees of dew point, with perhaps a 10 degree Fahrenheit difference in dry bulb temperature in the absence of any other dehumidification or humidification or heating and cooling equipment. And is what you're saying that the, and that is because moisture is going to be drawn out as the temperature, as the dry bulb temperature rises in the air, it's going to pull moisture out of stuff yes. in the house? Yes. And that's going to exacerbate the problem? Well, I don't know if it's a problem, but it's going to put more moisture into the air. It makes things more interesting. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it, it, you know, it is what it is. I mean, it's either a problem or not, depending on the range of values you're talking about. But that was the unexpected thing. So you asked for an unexpected thing that hmm. comes from measuring things. That was a big one for me, probably sometime between five and ten years ago. You know, that became very clear to me, uh, is that, We've always known, of course, if you change the temperature of stuff, you will change, in the absence of any other change, you change the temperature, you're going to mobilize water, it's going to want to come out of stuff. What was unexpected is that this happens with a 2, 3, 4, 5 degree Fahrenheit difference in, air te in average air temperature. That was the big gee whiz to me. But I stress that we're talking here not about a... Um, uh, a commercial building with a bunch of tile floors. Uh, what we're talking about is a residential situation where you have absorptive materials like wallboard, like carpets, like fleecy materials for upholstery, like books, uh, so that you have a lot of surface compared to the air volume that's enclosed. Hmm. And so it's going to be different than a courthouse. A courthouse yeah. where there are huge, wide open areas, and it's a lot of ceramic tile, and you don't have much in the way of fleecy materials. Hmm. Uh, but in a, in a house uh, where you have a lot of absorptive materials and a relatively small amount of air, a small change in temperature will create a significant, uh, a larger than expected <laughs> change in the absolute humidity in the house in the absence of any other factor. Mm -hmm. Now, Which that's reality, right? Oh, no. There's well, more factors. Actually, no. Uh, because the, the problem is that there are lots of other factors. <laughs> All right. So, so we'll, we'll set this to the side for a moment. Uh, on, a, on a related note, uh, people say there's this myth, and I don't know if it's true or not. I'd like to ask you since you're the expert. Um, they say that a furnace dries out the house and radiant is preferred because it makes the house more moist. And knowing how, as much as I know about this stuff, that seems like it's not actually true to me. Is it actually true or, or what's the deal? Well, I, I think it's fair to say that it's uh, true in some respects and completely false in others. And that's like a lot of things in, in building technology and building sciences that these, these sayings and thoughts persist because they have a, a great deal of truth to them. And yet, by themselves, they can be very misleading. So let's take that you know, one step at a time. If we talk about a forced air system, a furnace, so it's a furnace it's going to distribute air throughout it throughout a building, um, and uh, and the mythology is that that's going to make a dry environment. Well, it's certainly not going to make a dry environment if there's a humidifier on the furnace. If there's a humidifier that's going to add moisture, then it will be whatever the humidifier mm -hmm. can pump in. But it certainly is true that in the absence of any other factors, uh, ductwork tends to leak. We know this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ductwork I've leaks. heard about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think you know something about that, Carl. <laughs> you quantified that many times. So because ductwork leaks, uh, a duct system will pull dry air from outside in the wintertime into hmm. a building because you will have areas of local negative pressure and areas of local positive pressure. But the, the, the pressures created by a fan are so big compared to, you know, they're a hundred times greater than the, than the pressure created by stack effect, basically. Mm -hmm. 
So you will create pressure differences and that will result in dry air infiltration that probably will not happen as much in a house that's heated by radiant heat. Hmm. So yes, it's true that, uh, uh, that houses with uh, furnaces tend to be drier than those with only radiant heat, but if the radiant heat is also well ventilated, then the house with the radiant heat might be a great deal drier because you might be getting adequate ventilation from outside. So let's say all things being equal, a house is uh, airtight, insulated, ventilated to the standard that is enforced by the 2012 ICC, blah, blah, blah. And one of them has a forced air furnace and one of them has a boiler. Would, based on your logic, it sounds like not running a humidifier, that they would be the same they humidity. Will is that they correct? Will, they will be the same. They will be the same, and they'll both be pretty good because to meet the requirements of the energy codes, that's going to be a, uh, a heat recovery ventilator. Yeah, Interesting. But they will also be drier. Uh, they will be drier than, than many houses because of the fact that they are being ventilated to code. And unless you're in the Canadian north or in the northern tier, let's say Minnesota, you're probably not going to use an enthalpy heat exchanger to do the ventilation, so you're probably going to be losing humidity from inside. So when you're ventilating in the wintertime to code, uh, continuous ventilation of 90 to 65 to 95 CFM in a, in a house, that's going to be a continuous stream of, of air that will always be drier outside than what it is inside. So both the radiant heated house and the uh, and the uh, furnace heated house are going to be drier unless there's humidification mm. or unless there's enthalpy heat recovery, which is to say that not only are you recovering heat from the exhaust air, but you're also recovering humidity from the exhaust air. So since we're going down this path, and I, we will get back to how to think about drying in just the <laughs> principles of it, because I'm really interested in that. Um, the enthalpy dry, and we're talking about ERV, an energy recovery ventilator versus an HRV, which is just heat recovery ventilator, which is like sensible, right? So there's a, first of all, there's a big argument about which one you should use in mixed climates. I'm from Chicago. <laughs> you're from mixed Portsmouth. Climate, right? We've got people in, uh, you know, Texas has some heating. I'm sure Atlanta is heating dominated, but they still have a lot of air conditioning. Which one are you supposed to use is the question number one. Number two the manufacturers seem to be kind of building these hybrid systems that can kind of do both. They can do one or the other. And, and so do those words still apply ERVs versus HRVs or are there kind of hybrids now that are kind of in the middle? Um, and which one are we supposed to use and when? Uh, beats the heck out of me. Um, it's uh, it's still a pretty complex question, partly because the, as you say, the hardware is evolving and the, the big deal here to me with um, ERVs and HRVs is actually not so much a question of whether it should be recovering enthalpy or whether it should be recovering just sensible heat. Uh, you have to know that the first part of my career was selling enthalpy heat exchangers, so I'm a big oh fan. no, so I, he's so biased. I, <laughs> so I'm a big fan of enthalpy heat exchangers for many applications, just not for houses. Hmm. <laughs> And that's because usually humidity is a pollutant that you want to get rid of in a house more hours than you don't. So if you have air that is drier outside, that's probably what you want more of the time than mm. the humid air going out. But it depends. It depends on whether you're talking about public housing, where you're talking very densely occupied, highly humid indoor environment. Hard to tell what people are going to do when they're living in that environment. Well, and how many people they're going to be and what they're doing, as opposed to uh, two semi-retired, uh, you know, yuppies living in 4,200 square feet where it's quite dry inside because nobody's doing any cooking in there at all. Mm. So it's very different, and, and, and it's difficult, I think, therefore, to say we should be doing this versus that. But in general... Um, I think enthalpy heat exchangers are not the wonderful panacea that I certainly believe they were when I, you know, 1976 to 85, when I was selling those things for hospitals. There, it's a all the time. There's no question that everyone should be using enthalpy heat exchangers. Hmm. <laughs> but in a house, I think the question is more nuanced. And in, in terms of the technology, what you really want to avoid is you is you want to be able to modulate the amount of recovery. Uh, so that you're not recovering something you don't want to recover. You don't want to recover 
moisture a lot of the time in a house over 87, 60 hours of the year. There's a lot of the time you don't want any of that humidity back in the house. So to me, it's less a question of the membrane technology and, uh, and more a question of the controls. So getting back to the principles of how to think about drying, we've got the two different segments. We've got drying stuff and drying air. Since we're talking about buildings and specifically residential buildings and what we were just getting into, why don't we talk about drying air for a minute? What, what within drying air are important principles that are kind of basics for everyone to understand? I, th- I think the, the most important thing to think about when you're thinking about drying air, in other words, you're looking for comfort. You're looking uh, to prevent, you know, significant damage to a house. You're trying to keep the uh, humidity, the, the amount of water vapor in the air at a comfortable level. Uh, and if we're talking here about taking water out of the air, we're talking about the, the cooling season when you're taking it out of the air. The most important thing to think about uh, is where the humidity is coming from. Because that will tell you a lot about uh, the most cost-effective and the simplest way to take too much water out of the air is where it's coming from. So in a residence, as opposed to a commercial building, you have a couple sources that you don't have. And the biggest and the most important one uh, in a residential situation, a single-family residence, is cooking. Why is that different than showers? People think a lot about showers and you kind of idea, hey, you're going to put a lot of humidity in the air in showers and people grow mold because, you know, they don't take too many showers. Taking too many showers, you're too much too clean. And <laughs> so therefore you got mold, you know. It's just like, and, and really, the if you think about the time that you're taking a shower, it's not a lot of hours. Whereas cooking can be quite a lot of time and it, it can extend for large amounts of time and it can be a whole lot of uh, water into the air that may or may not be exhausted you know if you've got a you know shower toilet toilet exhaust in the bathroom and you're not using it then yeah you'll have a let's say 10 15 minutes worth of high humidity in there but with cooking you know a 10 minute cooking session that would be a pretty short one Hmm. Uh, whereas uh, uh, some people can cook for a very long time or if you are You know, uh, from the Indian subcontinent, you're going to cook for a long time to get a good, effective, you know, curry and so forth. If you're from Latin America, you might have, you know, sauces that you want to cook for a long time. If you're going to make coffee Lou Harriman style, it's a little bit more complicated than just... (laughs) (laughs) That's true, too. It'll take a while. It's good. Anything good takes time. Anything good takes time, and there's going to be water vapor evolved from that, and we don't always remove it from the house. So that would be number one principle of keeping the house at a comfortable humidity level and taking water out of the air is exhaust at the source. Exhaust at the source when the source is producing water vapor. Hmm. So uh, in a bathroom, you'd like to make sure that if you're taking a shower or taking a bath uh, or drying clothes uh, in the bathtub, that you are exhausting that, that extra humidity. In the kitchen, you'd like to make sure that you're exhausting uh, from the kitchen when you are cooking. Okay, so those are two big things that you really don't have to worry an awful lot about in an office building. There are very few office buildings that have a lot of people cooking curries mm. and they're whole, you know, or making boiling pots of pasta for, uh, you know, for 20 or 40 minutes or so. Very rarely happens. And not too many people take a shower in the middle of the office. That's a rare thing to have happen. So it's a sad truth of America. <laughs> sad percent. truth. Maybe we could benefit from that. <laughs> so that's that's one thing that happens in a house that doesn't happen in a commercial building. But the thing that does happen in a house these days, exactly like a commercial building, is a uh, perceived and a real need for for ventilation air to dilute indoor air contaminants. That has been at the root of a lot of the humidity control problems in commercial buildings, which is to say humidity too high Mm. because we have ventilated without drying that ventilation air. And that's what we are having now in houses is that we are ventilating without dehumidifying because there's no code that requires us in either commercial buildings. There's no guideline that 
in commercial buildings or residences that says that you should dry the ventilation air. So we don't because nobody wants to spend extra money for stuff that's extra. Mm. And therefore, we end up with more humidity in the house when we ventilate because if you look at the 8760 hour, the, the full year, 8760 hours is what we have in a year. And if we look at even a mixed climate, everything except a very, very dry climate, of which there are very few, the bulk of the load, the bulk of the, uh, uh, of, of the load that you have to uh, take out of the incoming air uh, in the, the north. The load meaning the actual water the that's cooling, coming in the on cooling The cooling load, the heating load, the dehumidification, the humidification load. It's all about the ventilation air. Hmm. And in the case of dehumidification, uh, in all except far northern climates and high altitude climates, and desert climates, the ratio of, uh, of humidity to take out of that ventilation air compared to sensible heat is anywhere from, from 3 to 1 or 5 to 1. In other words, in the Boston area, for example, it's about, about you're going to have to take about five times as much, uh, you know, load in terms of dehumidification out compared to, compared to heat out of that incoming ventilation air. So you've got a cooling load. You have to cool the incoming air, you know, in, in Boston, uh, but you have to dehumidify it too. And, the, and you have to do a whole lot more dehumidification of that air than you have to do cooling of it. So let me break it down just in case there's any uh, really tech-savvy homeowners or some contractors who are as smart as I am, which I'm very confused right now. So what you're saying is <laughs> we're bringing in air. From outside, we're exhausting air from inside to outside. We're rubbing it up against each other, and we've got an HRV that's just going to transfer the heat, which is good. But you're saying that it's not even a drop in the bucket compared to the amount of moisture that we're going to want to take out of that air that's coming in. Is that correct? That is correct. But when we say we want to take the water out of the air, it still depends on what level of humidity we want to have inside. And the fact of the matter is, we people can be quite comfortable at a very wide range of humidity levels, so absolute humidity levels, and even relative humidity levels. We can be comfortable at a lot of different levels. What what are those levels like? With some guidelines, we've heard in the residential market between you know thirty and fifty percent relative humidity in the wintertime is nice. Is that uh, the expert's opinion as well? And what about in the summertime? Uh, I think if you look at it on, a, on an annual basis, something between 30% relative humidity and 60% relative humidity would be the center of a rational comfort zone for a house that's being held between 68 degrees Fahrenheit and six and 78 degrees Fahrenheit. 68 to 78 might be a range. Within that range, 30% uh, uh, relative humidity uh, in the winter time, might be kind of a lower level of comfort at 68 to 72. Uh, and in the summertime, uh, at 72 to 78 degrees Fahrenheit, probably 60% RH would be, a, would, would be an upper boundary. Uh, but we have that range. So when I say load, what I'm talking about is if you wanted to keep a constant humidity level inside, if you, constant absolute or constant relative? A Just, constant, constant absolute level. Okay. Okay. So we don't care about relative humidity when we're talking about load because relative is relative to temperature and it squishes around. It's mm -hmm. squishy. When we're talking about load and taking water out of there, we have to speak in absolute humidity terms. So if we wanted to keep a, a constant absolute humidity, then under that circumstance, <laughs> we would have to take much more humidity out of the incoming air on an annual basis than we would taking heat out of the air in a mixed climate. In a southern climate, it's um, it's much closer to the same number, but it's still maybe three to one, not five to one. So there's still one heck of a lot more humidity in the air if we wanted to keep a constant level inside. But we can tolerate a lot of slop, and that's what we get. But the big point, and the, 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 the reason I want to mention this, is that when there's a humidity control, quote, problem, unquote, when it's an uncomfortable amount or an unproductive amount, or if we have moisture condensing inside or things like that, then we have to speak in terms of absolute humidity. And then the place to put your mind is the ventilation, the air, because that's where that constant load is coming from. So 
um, you mentioned we've got the HRV. What percentage of the houses in the United States have an HRV? I'd submit it's less than 5%. <laughs> I was going to guess one. <laughs> yeah. So I don't think we have those devices in most houses. So therefore, especially when we're talking about exhaust, kitchen exhaust in particular, uh, when we're talking about uh, houses with no makeup air system at all, uh, with no ventilation air system at all, uh, what we're talking about is exhaust that pulls in humid air from outside. And that's the air that's giving us so much trouble hmm. is when we're exhausting a lot of air, but we don't replace it with dry air. Mm -hmm. So that's it. So how exactly I have someone represent, represented an idea to me that I thought was kind of brilliant, which is to have a the return plenum be kind of a room at the bottom of a closet, like a little cavity, and to actually just have an outlet in there that you plug a dehumidifier in that room and have a duct through the wall to outside. So that is, first of all, is that a valid way to dry the incoming air in this kind of scenario? And secondly, how else would we dry the air that's coming in since we're really not, as you mentioned, not doing this at present? Uh, that can work, uh, and it can fail miserably. Uh, you know, one of my colleagues in Florida uh, uh, is in the process of, he's He's a registered professional engineer and a forensic engineer, and he was called in for 400 apartments where that was the basis of the design. So uh, the idea is you cut a small hole in the exterior wall, and that comes into a plenum in which there is mounted a conventional cooling-based Sears or Kenmore or, or Mitsubishi, somebody's dehumidifier mounted below an air handler. And that's the idea is that you're going to more or less dehumidify the return air and the incoming air blend. And that can work, but it is often problematic. And the reason is because that dehumidifier may or may not be effective. Uh, in other words, it may or may not take moisture out of the air. And number two, it may or may not take moisture out of the air when you want it to. The question is, how is that little guy controlled? Is it controlled with a humidist humidistat that works or one that doesn't? And is the humidistat mounted inside the cabinet of the dehumidifier? So it's sensing the humid air right next to the cooling coil, mm. and therefore it cycles on and off? Or is it mounted outside the way none of them are? Mm. <laughs> Except the one that I have in my basement, which I had to modify, so it didn't do that. <laughs> So there are reasons that that design uh, should work better than it, uh, than, it, than it often has. There are often other cases where it's worked just fine, where you have a smaller amount of loading, where you have a higher occupancy, where you have people that adjust that humidity sensor in the, uh, in the dehumidifier, where you have p people that actually clean the filter on the dehumidifier so it gets air instead of just slowly clogging with life crust. is so complicated. Ah, <laughs> but that said, but that said, you you asked, is that what we should do, or should we be doing something else? Mm. What we should be doing is something else. What we really should be doing is using hardware that doesn't exist, and that hardware would be designed so that it's a little miniature makeup air system for residences. And it would humidify in the winter, and it would dehumidify in the summer. It would heat in the winter, and it would, it would cool in the summertime, and it would do it within a range of values, and it would do that in a rational way. And it would be coupled with a heat recovery ventilator, and that would be a really nice thing to have. Okay, so I'm in. I'll be uh, an investor on the Lou Harriman project here. This is what you're saying is that the technology exists, but the product itself does not exist. Is that correct? That's exactly correct. Why? What is... What, what is people's problem that we don't have? And we've got all these manufacturers making all this stuff that they want to sell to us. Well, they make something that we actually need, especially with the codes going in place. Like, who, who do I need to knock on their door and tell them that they're being an idiot? <laughs> Nobody. Everybody is responding to rational cues from the marketplace. <laughs> Ouch. You hear that, homeowners? Ah, oh, it's our fault again. <laughs> it is. Because uh, it's very difficult for a homeowner to say, gosh, I don't have enough fresh air in here. Hmm. You know, and gee, I know what my problem is. I I have you know forty five cubic feet per minute instead of one hundred and fifty cubic feet per minute in this space. You know, it we we don't have easy metrics that give us the visual and sensory feedback to say 
I need something different than what I have because we have a very broad range of tolerance for this stuff as human beings. And that's, you know, from however many years of evolution you happen to believe that we've got. Mm. But we do have a broad range of tolerance. So do you say you just brought up metrics, which is one of my favorite topics. <laughs> so are, are, do you think that now that people, the, the, the younger generation of homeowners are having on their smartphones, they've got the data on what temperature their house is at and when their furnace is running. Do you think that absolute humidity might absolutely get into the, you know, the graph there that the homeowner is looking at, and maybe that metric will help to drive the market of, of inventing the products that they will want to buy? Well, I sincerely hope so, but that's probably a false hope in my case. Mm -hmm. I, I have spent uh, pretty close to 40 years in this industry, and I know that it's very difficult to educate people about the complexity of dew point versus relative humidity. So I, I think it's going to be a tough sell. I am... Vaguely optimistic, uh, well, not vaguely, I'm, I'm more than, I'm 30 or 40 percent optimistic that what we might have in the future uh, is a, a thermostat on the wall where you have a dial. It's a big, like, Frankenstein knife switch kind of dial. You know, you, you, you yank it back and forth between two extremes, and one says cooler and the other says drier. And if you had that instead of numbers and exactly dew point, and then the system was intelligent enough to make sure that it actually took moisture out of the air when it needed to, add it when it needed to, do cooling when it needed to. When you when you when you respond to your sensory, your sensory inputs, it says, "Gosh, it's too cold in here," mm. you know, as opposed to, "Gosh, it's muggy in here. I better make it colder." Mm -hmm. Which doesn't is not effective. What if we just took the thermostat to completely off the wall and we had a voice recognition system that just listens to you complain and based on the tenor of your voice, it would say, "Oh, good, it needs to be a little." <laughs> no, nah, I don't think so. I, <laughs> no, I, I, I like the idea of a, a, of a physical dial that uh, with with uh, uh, divisions but no numbers, and it says cooler or drier. Cool. To empower the homeowners to actually feel like they're participating. In and that. to avoid focusing on the numbers. Mm. Because people, if it is drier, will be more comfortable at a higher temperature. That will save energy and it will make them more comfortable. Mm. Uh, uh, similarly, in the wintertime, if we add a little bit more humidity, we can be cooler. We can be warmer, more comfortable at cooler temperatures. Mm. And that will be a good thing. So I think if we can if we can get thermostats that respond to sensory input and get the num the unproductive numbers out of people's minds, I think that will offer a lot of improvements. But we have to have equipment that will respond to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we can't have equipment that when you ask for dryer, it makes you colder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's some technology to that requires some work. <laughs> yeah. So the other division that we originally opened up this episode with is the uh, drying of stuff. Drying what stuff. principles do we need to know about the drying of stuff in order to be effective? I think the most important thing about drying stuff, another when I say stuff, I'm talking about, gee, the carpet's damp over here. Or gosh, that Wait, why is that carpet damp over there? Where is that carpet? Where is that dog? Because yeah, where, where is that dog? Where, you know, where are they? you got a pipe leak, and now you you fix the pipe leak, and mm -hmm. so now you need to dry something out, or you have uh, you got something that's you had a problem with the air conditioning, and everything got really muggy. It was either too cold or something, and now you got this damp feeling. Your sheets are damp. You need to dry stuff out. Well. I think that the most useful principle to keep in mind, something that a uh, very fine engineer told me a very long time ago, is says you've got to get the heat in to get the moisture out. You have to add energy. You have to add thermal energy to a damp material in order to mobilize that moisture, the, the, the water molecules that are in there. You have to get them moving. You have to get them moving so more of them will come to the surface. It also helps a lot if you happen to have hu uh, dry air in which to put that humidity <laughs> so that it will absorb that moisture. And maybe move the air a little bit over the material? Well, the, the reason that you want to move the air uh, over the material uh, is, is if that air is dry, you want to do that. If that air is humid, you don't want to do that. Because if the air is humid, 
then you might be adding moisture to that damp material, mm. not subtracting it. So you want dry air, and then you want to move it across the surface. You don't want to move it too quickly because you don't want to crack wood, for example, if it's moist. You don't want it drying really quickly. But you do want to have air movement across it so that you can pull the humid, the humid layer of air off the surface, <laughs> but not do it too quickly. <laughs> Could you also raise the temperature of the air that's around it, which would lower the relative humidity and turn the air into more of a sponge? Or is that a kind of ineffective? I mean, nope. is that a... Nope, that, 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 that's not a bad way to do it, as long as you aren't creating some counterproductive you know, phenomena at the same time. Like what? Like, for instance, uh, you, uh, you've got a damp area, so you're going to heat up that area with a hairdryer or something. Okay, so then you're going to mobilize that moisture. It's going to come out into the air. It's also going to be driven deeper into the building, too. <laughs> so maybe it would go to another part of the building and condense there. Mm. <laughs> so you do need to think a little bit about that. Mm. When you mobilize the moisture, it's going to go places. I'll tell you where it's going to go. It's going to go everywhere. But it's going to stay in the areas that are still cool. Why is it going to stay there? It's not going to go there because it's seeking the cold. It's going to go everywhere. But when it gets to the cool area, there's going to be less energy there. So it's going to want to stay there. Hmm. And that's the way to think about this business of, of humid air and humidity at dew point and relative humidity and stuff like that. You know, Think about the fact that when you have a lot of absolute humidity in the air or even a little bit, it's going to go to the coldest place along with every other place. But it's going to stay in the cold places. Hmm. That's the way to think about it. Not that it's going to go there like it's on a mission to get to the cold place. It's going to go everywhere, but it's going to stay in the cold places because there's no not as much energy there to lift it out and keep it moving and keep it in the air. Awesome. So, uh, first of all, I'm in for the all the products that are in your head. I hope that we get to hear a lot more about your ideas and see them actually come to life in real life. Lou Harriman, thank you so much for talking with us today. You're very welcome. It's a lot of fun, Corbett, as always. You have been listening to the Building Performance Podcast from the Building Performance Workshop. I'm Corbett Lunsford. Tune in next time. Hey, podcast buddies. It's Corbett. Thanks for hanging out past the music. I just wanted to reach out and say that I would love if you would do two things for me. One is if you would rate and review this podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts, it would mean a lot. Uh, we are trying to build this audience from nothing. It's a shoestring budget. I don't know if you know this, but I record these episodes on my iPhone um, around the country and around the world when I, when I travel uh, and also on the phone. So thank you for listening to the phone ones too. The second thing that I would love to have you do is uh, if you have a special topic or a special person that you would like to hear more about on this show, I would love to hear from you. So please do feel free to reach out and I will respond. Thanks very much for listening. Tune in next time.